Good morning, everyone. How about the 270 this morning? Should we just have a, a, a moment of silence for 270? I literally walked in two minutes ago, literally walked in. Uh, I'm sending lots of prayers for whatever happened on 270 this morning, but I'm feeling some kind of way that there's only just a few ways to get from the northern end of this county to the southern end of the county. And I happen to think that I was very brilliant. I got off of 270 because I heard the traffic. I was very bad. And then guess what happened? Everybody else got off too. <laughs> and they got on 355, and then they got on Veers Mill, and then the rest is history. So with that, though, I'll say good morning to you. Happy 2016. And I am delighted uh, to be here with you this morning. Uh, we're already halfway through January, but it never feels like uh, the new year until we're able to come together at the start of the semester. In fact, uh, the sp spring semester always has a very special start date for me because it's always right around uh, my son's birthday. And today is actually his birthday. So I got to give him lots of hugs and kisses this morning, uh, and him being a wonderful nine today. Um, many of you remember when we got here, he was three, so he's nine now. And uh, he told me, good luck today, mama, uh, on, the, on, the, on the beltway. He likes to say the beltway, on the beltway. So I have to tell him he did not send enough good wishes my way. <laughs> Um, but I'm so glad that we're here, and I hope that you all noticed on your way in that we're showcasing the Milestone Moments project today in order to give everyone a chance to look at some of our extraordinary accomplishments as an institution over the last five years. I'm really proud of the work that we've engaged in as an institution that chronicles our growth and our development as a, as a college. And I hope that you'll take a copy of the publication with you and explore the website when you have a chance to do so. We are such a large and complex institution that it is almost impossible to keep up with all the developments over time that happen here. So the better that we have information about that, the better advocates that we become for the organization and to the supporters that we need to attract to this mission of what we do at Montgomery College. Now we have some very special guests here today uh, that I want to acknowledge. 17 teachers from South Korea are here in an exchange program put together by Montgomery College, MCPS, and the Daejeon Metropolitan Office of Education in South Korea. Would you all please stand? I thought about you all this morning and, and wondered how the weather made you feel as you were here today. It, it, it's very, very cold outside. Uh, but this collaboration uh, warms my heart because it is designed to expand professional and cultural learning experiences for the secondary teachers from South Korea. Uh, we're very proud to be hosting them here for a series of workshops and cultural enrichment activities. They will be working with Montgomery College faculty in STEM and global humanities on integrating these themes across the curriculum. And to our guests, as you travel around the college, you will find that Montgomery College is proud of our diversity. You will probably know that we have no racial majority here at Montgomery College, and we have students from over 160 countries in our student body. We have MOUs with schools and businesses in China, El Salvador, India, Ethiopia, and South Korea. In fact, some of our students, faculty and staff, are at the University of Gondar in Ethiopia right now, uh, working on some cultural exchanges and curriculum development there. So we encourage our students here at Montgomery College to expand their horizons to engage in academic exchanges and experiences that expose them to other cultures, histories, and languages. We are so delighted that you've chosen to be here at Montgomery College today to enrich your experience, but I also know for a fact that you have already enriched us with your presence here. Welcome to Montgomery College and to Maryland. And on that note, I want to say how proud I am of the culture and climate of civility and inclusion that we have been fighting to protect at Montgomery College. 
As you know, last semester, the Muslim Students Association conducted what I believe to be some courageous outreach to fellow students, faculty, and staff members, which I think will reinforce the value that we place as an organization on diversity and multicultural knowledge here at Montgomery College. And I want to commend those students who hosted those events. I can't imagine uh, what they must have felt like talking about their experiences and sometimes speaking truth to power to audiences who may not know how to interpret that, who may have been resistant, who may have had questions. So I celebrate them for what they did. I don't think I need to remind anyone here today, however, what a politically volatile world that we're living in right now. And as President Obama said in his State of the Union just last week, quote, we need to reject any politics that targets people because of race or religion. Every member of the Montgomery College community, inside and out, has the right to feel safe and comfortable on our campuses. So we need to continue to be sensitive to religious and ethnic differences in our words and in our deeds. Prejudice and ignorance on our campuses will not take root, thrive, or survive if we reject them on an individual and community level. Thank you. Now, it's no coincidence that I mentioned our diversity as an institution, because I want to talk to you today briefly about a concept that is related to diversity, but also quite distinctive from it. I've been thinking a lot about the notion of equity in this past year. Uh, we know that there's diversity at Montgomery College. As you know, I easily rattled off the number of countries that we have. You look across the room and you can see faces from every hue and shade, uh, multiple experiences represented here. And we know that we have diversity at Montgomery College, but I'd ask you, do we have equity at Montgomery College? I looked the word up in the dictionary because I have been involved in several leadership development conversations of late where we've been thinking and talking a lot about equity-mindedness. In short, not a surprise to you, equity is defined as, quote, fairness or justice in the way people are treated. Is there equity in the student experience here at Montgomery College? How do we tell that? Ultimately, while some may think it to be a fairly subjective measure, I think that equity really comes down to one single word, outcomes. Are students achieving the goals that they need to reach? Are they reaching the milestones that are going to propel them to the next level? To be completely honest, when I look at our 59% of students who don't graduate or transfer with a degree or certificate, I don't see equity. I don't see fairness or justice, in fact. And you all remember the scorecard that we put up on the website last year? Hope you have with all the graphs of students and about their retention and their completion rates. When I look at this graph and I look at our success rate, our 41% success rate, I have to ask myself, is this what equity looks like? Are we falling short in what we do for our students if that many of them are not leaving with a credential that helps them in their professional life? And my answer to this is simply and unequivocally, yes. Yes, we are falling radically short in this work that we need to be doing. This leads me to another concept that has been useful to me in thinking about this problem. And it's called radical inclusivity. I'm convinced that the work that we do in teaching and advising and counseling and administering and supporting is going to have to be radically inclusive as an organization in order to get the outcomes that we want and that our students need. 
our practices and our deeds as an institution are going to have to become radically inclusive. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, first of all, let me say that higher education as a rule has not been organized around student needs, per se. It has traditionally structured itself according to how administrators think a system should work or how instructors think pedagogy works best. To enact radical inclusivity, we have to be willing to act differently, to put students at the center of not just our thinking, but also our actions and ourselves in supporting roles for their success. We have to be willing to take a hard look at ourselves and say that a 41% success rate is not enough. And certainly, it certainly places us in contemporary with lots of community colleges in this country. But we have to be willing to constantly reinvent ourselves in order to serve the students where they are, not where we think they are. This is actually, I think, a radical approach. We're inverting the horizon, looking at things from a completely new perspective. Now, this isn't always comfortable. I can tell you, in fact, it's usually uncomfortable. But I think we have to ask ourselves, are we actually comfortable with our 41% success rate? Because if we're not, then we have to be willing to try new approaches. Now, I want to share one strategy that might seem mundane at first, but if you take a closer look, I'd say it's actually pretty radical. At her retirement party, um, our departing Vice President Provost, uh, Dr. Judy Ackerman, who was at the college for 43 years, offered some wonderful comments, but there was one that resonated with me and it stuck with me ever since then. And she says that, quote, every student has a story. Listen to them. Every student has a story. Listen to them. And it has stuck with me ever since I heard that. So I'm going to take this one step further and say that listen to these stories and allow them to act on you. Allow the lives of our students to change your work. Allow their needs to guide your pedagogy. Allow their challenges to shape your advising or your leadership. This radically inclusive student-centered model is not the easiest one. It's challenging because students' needs change rapidly based on the economy, social circumstances, and demography, and that means that a constant reinvention on our part can be quite tiring as an organization. In fact, it's exhausting when you do it time and time again. Some days, I'll admit, I'm exhausted by this work. Um, but I'm also invigorated more often than not. It feeds my soul, but threatens to steal my spirit from time to time. There is always a tension, I think, if you're going to be doing this work right. What keeps my head above water are the students themselves and their driving need for success. Our efforts have some wonderful, innovative, and energetic models that serve students so well all across this institution. Our academic restructuring has reorganized our departments so that we're more efficient, but also more rigorous and relevant in our academic delivery. Our student success scorecard has become a reliable barometer of success and progress, helping guide our programs and get us all on the same page when we talk about student success. Our ACES program has grown from 1,000 students to 1,700 students in three years, with many ACES students outperforming students who are not enrolled in that program. And our achieving, yeah, And our Achieving the Promise initiative is getting off the ground this semester, with 35 new associates being hired to coach an estimated 500 students. 
And as you heard earlier, we just found out on Friday that we have been accepted by the Achieving the Dream Network as well. So we'll be getting even more guidance about how to design for student success. Every one of these initiatives that I've mentioned and more that I haven't even was in response to a student need. Someone in somewhere, at somewhere listened to student stories and said, we can improve this progress. We can give students more support here. Now I just mentioned ATD, as we're calling it, which some of you may be familiar with. And as was shared earlier, it is an initiative run by the Lumina Foundation and is focused on, quote, low-income students and students of color completing their education. In other words, equity is their agenda. Their approach is evidence-based institutional improvement, so they work and partner with colleges like ours and help them to support their student success goals with coaches, advisors, and a broad network of colleges. They offer a strong toolbox to strengthen the kinds of institutional efforts that we're already making towards student success. ATD is simply going to enhance what we're already doing here at the college, but hopefully give us a few new tactics to consider. Simply put, based on what I've heard from members of the work group, I believe ATD is a valuable resource that provides tools and support to our critical work here around equitable student outcomes. And I know that we'll be hearing more about them as the semester comes up. So I'm excited about this initiative and ones that like that are providing strategies to institutions to focus more clearly around equitable student learning outcomes. And I'm proud of the effort and work that have already, has already taken place in programs like ACES and Achieving the Promise. And these programs are making clear, measurable outcome differences in our students' outcomes here at the college. But I also recognize that much of our success is going to have to take place outside of these programs. Achieving the Promise is set to serve 500 students this semester. ACES currently serves about 1,700. We have 35,000 credit students and 25,000 non-credit students. Without a broader commitment by faculty and staff and administrators to radical sense of transformation, we won't move the needle on the 59%. The lifeblood of the work of this organization comes from people like you. On every campus, at every location, whether you're in the classroom or supporting the classroom, providing support services to students, cleaning buildings, keeping maintenance working, all of you are integral in the student experience. So you have to be willing to say, I think, I can help transform the culture. I will put students at the center of my work, not just the center of my universe. I will challenge myself and others in how I think and act in this work that we do here at Montgomery College. I can collaborate with other departments and programs and services. I can work in a different way than what I have been doing. I want to focus on this last part because it speaks to a few things I've been doing in my own professional role. Uh, my job duties have changed a lot since I first became a college president. Uh, I never thought that I'd have to spend so much time fundraising, asking people for checks with lots of zeros behind them, <laughs> and also talking to legislators and business leaders about supporting Montgomery College some who don't know what we do, some who know us well, some who are a little suspicious of this thing called community colleges, and some who have no clue what we do. So that work becomes exhausting day in and day out. However, for me, the value of community colleges have always been very clear to me. But I have learned that that is not true for everybody in this county and in this state. So I've had to reinterpret my role as a college president. I've had to prioritize advocacy and fundraising 
even though they are not always the place from which I draw my own energy and inspiration, because I understand that they are vital in accomplishing what I believe our institution can do for our students. These tasks are necessary to help build an institution in which more of our students are achieving and thriving, and this is the outcome that I want to see happen. So I've had to make a shift. And I also think that each of us in our roles will have to think about the nature of work that we do, whatever role you have within the institution. So here's a question, and ask yourself, what can I do differently to build a culture of radical inclusivity here at Montgomery College? And this is going to look differently for people in different roles. For some, it may be a different way of teaching. We've redesigned our general studies major, for example, and that has impacted teaching and advising. We're looking at new technologies and have adopted new technologies for advising and working with students. We're also had, uh, have made to make adjustments in many things. I've challenged our administrative team to be more systems-minded and look at how their work works together with area, other areas of the college. A number of divisions and departments are working much more closely together and are designing programs that increase academic rigor while boosting achievement. That's a new mutually beneficial outcome that's picking up steam and we're going to see more of this. So let me suggest something a little provocative as well. Your answer to this question right here, what can I do differently to build a culture of radical inclusivity at Montgomery College, should make you a little uncomfortable. If it doesn't, it probably is not asking enough of you. I've been thinking a lot about this in the new year. We all sit down to make resolutions. Anybody make resolutions for the new year? Yeah, I see lots of hands going up. I've tried to do a dream board, a vision board for the year. Yeah, me and Oprah. And uh, I think a lot about it, and I look at it every day. It's sitting right over my vanity, and I'm thinking about already how I've forgotten the eight cups of water I'm supposed to have a day, you know, more exercise, all those kind of talk to my girlfriends more. Uh, all those different types of things. Everyone promises that they're going to do things differently when the new year starts. It always seems to be the case. But the reason that they don't usually stick with them is because those changes, those differences are uncomfortable. They shake us from what we traditionally do. So getting up at 5 or 5.30 to exercise and you have not been doing that, that takes a lot out of you and it makes you uncomfortable. We have difficulty as humans experiencing sustained uncomfortableness. We have difficulty as humans dealing with sustained uncomfortableness, unless there is some condition that makes us even more uncomfortable. So the 59% figure that I've talked about this whole academic year it makes me profoundly uncomfortable. And it should make you uncomfortable as well. As an institution, we're not functioning optimally if these outcomes are the ones that we're getting and not seeing a change in them. And that's not to say that any one person or group is not working hard. I know that, I hear it, I see it. By the end of the semester, we look like we have been out fighting a war every day. I get it. You know the expression, though, is that we have to work smarter, not harder. And we're just now figuring out what that means for us as an institution to work smarter, to work so that the outcomes we get reflect the investment that we're making in our effort. Now, I mentioned that ATD tries to help institutions to structure <coughs> excuse me, their growth around evidence-based instruction improvement. We've already started that work with our student success scorecard, but we're going to have to step up our game in this space. Outcomes are going to become the gold standard. And as we move into our accreditation work, you'll hear more about outcomes, outcomes, and outcomes will be the constant refrain. The hard work that we're doing at Montgomery College is going to have to create a climate of inclusivity that we're going to have to make sure is equity-based. And I guarantee you 
that is going to require more adjustments as an institution. Radical inclusivity has the word radical in it for a reason. It means very different from what has come before. It means, it comes from the word root. You know, the roots of a plant are the whole basis for its survival. So that's pretty fundamental. So if we're going to get radical about inclusivity and equity, we're going to have to get to the root of the issues of the organization that may or may not be supporting that. Another essential component to our success is going to be inserting ourselves more intentionally in the lives of our students. And I want to share with you a set of experiences that I had this semester that has profoundly impacted for me the way I think about the 59%. As I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work with the fundraising and the advocacy, and I realized for me uh, where I get my energy, uh, where I get my inspirations from the students. So this semester, um, I knew I needed to have more than just this high at commencement or in the hallways or the random interactions that I would have with various students. I needed to have ongoing, sustained involvement and engagement with students in a way that reminds me each and every week why I do this work. So this year, I decided to change uh, my agenda some um, and to teach a seminar for a group of our ACES students based on the book, Speak Truth to Power, Human Rights Defenders Who Are Changing Our World uh, by Carrie Kennedy Cuomo. It looks at the writings of people like Desmond Tutu, the Dalai Lama, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, among others, and asks, what keeps them going? How do they measure success? How do they overcome fear? With these people as inspiration, I asked our students that I had in this class to answer the question, what do you have to confront in order to be successful at Montgomery College? I asked them to look at these courage, courageous figures, people who stood up to intolerance, fear, prejudice, violence, even death, and to see what challenges they had to overcome to accomplish what they had in order to change the community of which they were a part. Most of the people we read had become activists or leaders in their community. Then I asked my students to look at their own lives and identify the hurdles that they face. For some, it was working too many hours that kept them from studying. You're not surprised to know that. For others, it was not having a permanent place to live. For one of them, it was a parent's addiction. Several students had no guidance about how to approach college because they had just never seen anyone do it. In fact, when I told them my own story to college, I was so surprised the number of times they would say, you didn't just come like this? <laughs> and I said, no, I was 18 and stupid. I was 19 and stupid. I did a lot of things <laughs> that would belie the fact that I'm standing right here right now. And for them to hear that, it automatically changed their reaction about what their future could be. They could see what their primary obstacles were. Then we all looked at the lives of these activist heroes and how they have found their sources of strength and courage, and we tried to help each other find places of passion and encouragement in their own experiences. And it was a wonderful course for me personally, and I was professionally aside, but personally, it reminded me why I love this work. It really buoyed me to remind, it reminded me that each of us has to care about the student experience. And for me, it was deeply uh, connecting to have that experience with them. I know that some of you have been teaching for decades, and many of you have been serving students for decades. You already know this lesson. You've already committed to students. Um, no matter what the external pressures are, you're every day in the trenches doing the work with students, and I know that. But I needed to re-examine and re-experience it after some time away from the classroom. In this process, I learned something new, that we don't always understand the complexity of the lives of our students. We don't always appreciate what our students are bringing with them to the classroom. 
to their experience here at Montgomery College. And these factors impact their success profoundly. I had a whole class day designed to talk about a particular issue, and I happened to be, it was midterm, and I asked them, how are you doing at midterm? And I went around to each student in this seminar. So that was two hours that was completely changed from what I had on the lesson plan for that day. And in that experience, we had lots of tears uh, that was going around. We had people expressing great frustration and, and, and some who were talking about success. I can't believe I'm getting a C or a B in this class already. Like, okay, well, how are you gonna get an A? Powerful conversations about their interactions with the college. One was experiencing housing insecurity and had bed bugs that she was toting from one couch to another. Another was struggling to keep up academically and didn't know how she was going to do that. Their lived experiences profoundly moved me and made a few things abundantly clear. First, we need to propel our students to use the resources that we've put in place at Montgomery College. Financial aid, tutoring, learning centers, mentoring, foundation dollars, counseling. What I learned from these groups of students, and it was interesting, almost half the time I'd say to them, I did, uh, have you tried X resource? Have you been here? Oh, I didn't know we had that. I didn't know that. Where can I find that? How do I get to them? Who do I call about that? Is there a website about it? Always the refrain, probably seven times out of 10. We are the bridges for our students and their support systems that they may not even be aware of that exist here at the college. The second strategy that I think that we have to embrace is listening to students and helping to build an institution that is responsive to them. Some of the challenging life circumstances that our students face will be deciding factors in shaping their futures here and beyond. Unless there is someone willing to make themselves uncomfortable that being one of us who are in this space right now or watching us on video in your offices, unless someone is willing to reach out and make a student's success their business, these students will languish and they will fail. I did this semester with one group of students. I just had 15 of them. That's all. I get it. But the reality about that is that with this group, they gave me insights into Montgomery College that I never would have had otherwise. They showed me that we're doing good in many areas, and they also showed me that we can be doing better. But they also gave me insight, which is what I'm talking, why I'm talking to you today. I got connected with a couple of these students last semester who are not ACES students um, in order to see what their pathway looks like. One of them is a young woman named Carla, who is a scholar in Generation Hope the only nonprofit in DMV working with parenting teens to complete college. And she's also a student at Montgomery College. I'm sponsoring her and with a scholarship and mentoring. And as a part of this, I communicate every week with her, usually by text, because I've come to find out that's the only way they seem to talk. <laughs> in the process, I've learned a lot about what food you can't buy with WIC how complex the legal system is in negotiating parental rights. I've learned how her work schedule is tightly coupled with the family support she's receiving, and how hard it is to imagine going to college when you're chronically sleep deprived and now your baby is teething. I've also grown close to a young man named Daquan, whom I met on the opening day in the fall semester. Uh, his protective stance and his general look of discomfort suggested to me that this Montgomery College experience was a crucible moment for him. First week of classes here at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus, he wouldn't look me in the eye. He kept turning his head, avoiding me. He had this huge sweatshirt on. You might remember the first week of classes here? It was like in the 90s. It was hot and humid. He had this sweatshirt on. and I could, You know how you can look at somebody? and you see their spirit all around them, and you know that something is going on with them. So I sat down and I just started talking to him, and he tells me about the fact that he's from Southeast DC, he's coming here to take classes because he knew he had to do something different because he watched his brother be killed last year. He was in the life, 
He said, I'm trying to get out of it. I got to be around different people. I said, but you can't isolate yourself while you're trying to get away from what you knew. And he, I said, I see you, Daquan. I see you. And we sat and talked for a little while. And he and I, I said, give me your number. And we started texting regularly over the course of the semester. And we've kept in touch the whole semester. Didn't take a lot of energy on my part, but it was a simple outreach. And it connect, kept me connected to him. I got to see a little of his trajectory starting at enrollment. You can see that he has some hiccups around financial aid, if you look her here. Uh, you can see that he loves his teachers. That made my heart so happy when I saw that. Then at midterms, you see, I had a little anxiety when I didn't hear back from him from two weeks. You can see there's a pattern. About every two weeks, I check in with him, and I didn't hear from him. And after a little prodding, he resurfaced, resurfaced, and he sent me a message. And then when registration came up, I wanted to make sure he was on track, because I know that these deadlines come up pretty fast. I wanted to make sure he knew what he needed to do. And he kept all the balls in the air and is now registered for the spring semester. What I think is amazing is the last set of messages in which he reached out to me to tell me about his success. You'll notice everyone had been me reaching out to him. The last one, he wanted to tell me that he was doing well in his writing class. So he and I have a lunch date coming up very quickly because I needed him to know that he mattered to me that the college mattered to him, and that we want him to be successful here. Being connected with these students has been an immeasurable gift for me this semester in ways that go beyond just the simple outreach that we do each and every day and walking down the halls and attending a student council meeting, very profound. But this idea of being a part of the lived experiences of these students, it changed my life. Uh, to be invested in a student's story doesn't take a lot of energy. Oftentimes, I could do that in between a meeting, sometimes in a meeting. <laughs> but it can be a lifeline for so many of these students. The ACE of students whom I got to know even more in depth over the semester taught me a lot about the student stories that we don't always get to hear. I got to peek into their lives and see firsthand how they're walking through Montgomery College, the experiences they have. And I want to share some of that with you. And although they face some significant challenges, they're achieving in ways I think that will inspire us all. Before I came to Montgomery College, it was a very tough moment for me. My grades were very low. My parents were going through divorce, and my mother and my sister and I or going from place to place, looking for a place to sleep. High school for me was a difficult time. My family was going through a lot of economic problems, and I needed to contribute to the home since I wasn't working at the moment. Besides that, my grades weren't that great, simply because of all the worrying that was um, happening in my family. Before college and high school, I thought I was going to go to college. I didn't know how I was going to make it happen. I just didn't know what to do. I doubted myself a lot, and also, like, I didn't know if I, like, how I was going to pay for college, right? <laughs> because college is really expensive. I didn't have good examples in my life, neither my mom or my dad. I've always had drugs around me, and when police officers arrested my mother and my, my father, I felt that sense of security that they would give me. I, I felt safe, so I wanted to do that for other people. I'm like, if they can make me feel safe, like this, I can, I can do that for other people, which is why criminal justice came up. I'm like, they make me feel safe. I want, I want to do the same for my community. To be honest, I had no intention of going to college because of my family situation and looking at my sister. She had all these student loans she had to pay back and that just discouraged me. And I said, no, there's no way. It's not possible. I cannot make it. But then ACEs came and my life changed. I signed up for it because I didn't have the support of my family and I knew at the program when they explained it to me that it was going to help you with um, resources, they were going to help you, mo motivate you. So at the time I needed motivation because I was not motivated at all to finish high school. So after I read the paper that ACES gave us, I was like, why not give it a try? So I gave it a shot and I'm happy that, I'm happy where I'm at now because of it. 
The ACES program was something that didn't really spoke to me. I was hesitant to join. And, and if it wasn't for one wonderful teacher that I had back then, an English teacher, um, he insisted on me to join or just give it a try. And the thing is that during that year, a lot of problems were happening in my life. And I was considering dropping out. And once I realized what the ACES program was, it really helped me a lot. In, and, and all the things, all the doubts that I have uh, about dropping out, they just disappear. It's hard to speak out when you're in when you're in need, when you need help, it's very hard to open up. But this ACES coach was someone that I could confide in. So whenever I just, I'm stressed out, all, sometimes all I need is an ear to hear me out. And I signed up for it mainly just because like, okay, I guess it'll help a little bit. Then when I met the counselor, Ms. Natalie Sanchez, she's great, uh, wonderful, actually helped me and a bunch of other students motivate us, push us forward, teach things that we didn't know before. When I need help scheduling, when I don't know what to do for money, when I don't know where I'm going to transfer to, I can say, hey, Natalie, uh, can I come by today? She's like, yeah, absolutely. She helps me. The ACES coaches provided us with uh, workshops to help us build our self-confidence. That's number one. Number two is they will help us with our financial aid and help us um, keep track of deadlines so we never miss any important dates. You have to keep yourself on track and motivated. We make a plan for our credits. I think the, like, before my first semester even started, we had to make a, a planner. And I had no idea what to put on. And they're like, all right, put them in credits you're taking here. What class are you taking? First semester, second semester? I was dumbfounded. I was like, oh, no. I think if students actually made a plan for themselves, like a tangible piece of paper they can see and look at for what they have to do, they can get out on time and actually get their credits they need. If there was an app, uh, yeah, it'd be great like some online application, you pick your major, comes up with a list of cl potential classes for such and such, and you kind of just input them in there, and that's it, you go about it. They took my mind away of stuff that I was struggling with. So if I had problems at home, I knew I could contact my ACES coach and they would be there for me. They would tell me what I should do or if I need help with homework, Homework and coming to school would take my mind off of whatever I was struggling at at home or with my family. And if I needed help with English or math, they would provide me with resources. They would tell me, go here, you can go to the writing center and go to the math lab. They will help you. They will just direct me where I needed to go. And that's what I needed. I needed that direction in my life that I guess my parents were not providing for me. And when I joined ACES, they gave me that motivation and they gave me inspiration to become someone in life and I'm so happy that I joined it. They've, they've motivated me, they've built my self-esteem up as well. My ACES coach, Dr. Robinson and Miss Lance, they've talked to me a lot about um, connecting, you know, what I want to do in school with what I want to do in life. The moment I joined the ACES program, I felt prepared. I, I knew I had it because they just kept us going. We, we were on top. This semester was really hard for me. But ACES was always like, like Miss Lance was always there checking up on me. How are you doing with this? How are you doing with that? Even when like I had a bad grade, she was like, what are you doing to fix this, right? So it's, they, they're always there to help, really. But well, personally, the ACES program gave me hope and gave me self-confidence. ACES, what they do is they, they support you. They have, they, they're your support group. So they will literally like tell you, you can do it. Every time you say you can't do it, they're like, no, yes, you can. So I'm thinking about Selena right now because I know that she was struggling in a class and I haven't asked her how that semester went yet to finish the last grade. And I'm thinking about Geraldine who took a winter session class. He wasn't up here this semester. And I'm thinking about Miss Audrey Awesome who has signed up and is starting her own nonprofit and is doing an event, in fact, next semester. So every time I think about this work, and I think about these wonderful students, um, these faces and these stories come up. And I'm sure many of you have them. And I think every time you sit in a department meeting, you sit in a governance meeting, you sit in a search committee, you sit in whatever meetings that we have so bountiful here at our organization, I, I challenge you to take a student story and a student face with you into that. Uh, when you're thinking about whether or not someone should be able to find 
a pathway easily through Montgomery College. I challenge you to think about one of these students here who literally felt at times that the organization was bouncing her around. I want you to think a lot about the fact that the expectations for what we do as a community college are on a whole different level than what people have traditionally expected us to do. And there's so many ways in which you can engage in students' lives. You don't have to teach an entire class or a series of classes, but you're already teaching a class. If you're doing that, that's great. That's powerful work that's happening. And then you don't have to go too far to find students that you can reach out to. I'm willing to bet that each of you has some portion of that 59% in your classrooms or your counseling sessions or your help desk or your laboratories or your support centers or the area of the building for which you're responsible for maintaining. There are lessons that can be learned from each and every one of them. I will never forget when I was at Las Positas College, the reason we found out about a growing homeless population in Dublin and Livermore, California, it was not because of some president walking around seeing it, a faculty member reporting it through governance, whatever. It was from a third shift maintenance worker who would talk about the fact that he stayed later at the end of his shift to open up the showers to allow groups of students to have access to those showers. And he would personally pay for them to have breakfast because the cafeteria wasn't open yet for this group of students who were leaving a shelter, coming on campus to change clothes and take a shower to eat and then to go to class. Everybody has an impact in the student experience. Many of you already are doing this, but I hope you continue to ask these questions. What's going on at home that can't help you be prepared for the classes? Why aren't you attending this tutoring sessions that you committed to last week? And we've been doing a lot of talking about curricular pathways through Montgomery College, but there is a layer of day-to-day -day personal pathways that each of our students is carving through at Montgomery College. Helping our students to clear aside those things that are standing in their way and that are breaking, their, breaking them from being successful at the institution is something each and every one of us can do. At an institutional level, we need to be doing the same thing, focusing clearly on equitable outcomes, clearing away those dynamics that hinder our organization, and marshalling all of our creativity and our approaches to student support. We need to be radical about this process. We need to be collaborative. We need to be uncomfortable because the results, our students' lives, hold richer rewards than we can imagine. Have an outstanding semester and remember both the 41% and the 59%. Thank you.